Um, hello everyone, thank you for joining CALA 2020 and welcome to today's panel featuring Ella Maya Telfeathers and Larissa Berendt entitled Trauma and Why Stories Keep Us Alive. My name is Temba Bebe and I'm an industry program with several specialities, one of which is diversity inclusion, um, in particular at the European film market where I've, I have been in charge of its diversity inclusion initiative for the past three years. Um, I've also worked as Indigenous Cinema Coordinator attached to the Native Indigenous Cinema Stand at the EFM as part of a collaboration between the EFM Imaginative as well as the Stand's other partners such as the International Sami Film Institute, Sundance's Indigenous Programme, Film GL, Nietero and many more. Um, and today I'm extremely honoured to be one of the moderators and programme advisors for CALA 2020 and as such I wanted to say a special thank you to WIFDI um, for bringing CALA 2020 into being. Um, and as I said, joining us today are Elamaya Tailfeathers and Larissa Berendt. Elamaya Tailfeathers is one of those um, enviable, multitasking, multi-talented individuals. Um, she is a writer, a director, a producer and an actor. Um, she's a member of the K9 First Nation as well as the Sami um, Nation from Norway. And our talk today will feature reflections on her film, The Body Remembers When the World Broke Open. Um, which premiered at, gener at the Generation section of the Berlinale in February 2019 and went on to win a raft of awards and nominations at various festivals around the globe. Um, Larissa Berendt is another enviable, multifaceted, multitasking individual. Larissa is a professor of Indigenous research and director of research at the Jumbunna Institute for Indigenous Education and Research at the University of Technology, Sydney. Um, today's conversation will draw upon her powerful 27 documentary, After the Apology, which is really a testament to the resilience of grassroots movements in the face of trauma and was also shown at a raft of festivals in Australia and the world. Um, so in order to ease us into the discussion today, I wanted to first of all show the trailers of both of these wonderful films. Oh, powerful stuff. Um, Larissa and Elamaya, first of all, thank you. Thank you for making the time to be here. Um, and um, Elamaya, also congratulations on the pickup of your film um, by Array recently. Uh, and so I wanted to begin um, by looking at the question of activism within both of your films. Um, I saw both films within six months of one another at Imaginative in 2019. And then in my preparation for the EFM, uh, which um, the body remembers when the world broke open was featured in several panels that I was organizing. Um, both films affected me and I think many audiences profoundly because of the traumas which were portrayed. Um, on the one hand, domestic violence, and if we can extrapolate that, the murder and disappearance of indigenous women in Canada. And on the other hand, the forced removal of the Aboriginal children from their families by social services in Australia and how um, the number of those cases have literally just exploded exponentially. Um, yet beyond the trauma of both films, I really found them um, both to be um, life affirming, both um, on screen and off screen in their activism. Um, and so I wanted you to walk us through um, how intentionality and how activism came to be at the center of both of your films. Um, perhaps we can start with Larissa. Thank you. Um, yeah, look, I guess for me, the filmmaking also came out of my, my work as a lawyer. So these were not just stories I came across for the purpose of the film, but stories I'd been involved with um, for a long time. And I think that's an important point to, to start with because, you know, I think as filmmakers, when we're going in to tell stories where there's, there's deep trauma, um, this, the, the level of trust needs to be really high between us as storytellers and the people whose story we're telling. Um, so I think the long relationships were a big, a big part of um, why I felt it was important. I guess the other thing too that I had to think really carefully about in relation to trauma and the subject of the film was that I knew that, it, particularly in the Australian context, the uh, parents and grandparents who spoke out in the film would be attacked by the right-wing mm. press that are very aggressive about 
um, Indigenous issues and particularly take a line that child removal is something that happens because Aboriginal people and families don't care about their children. So I did actually work on finding the voices of people who were already speaking out and had, I guess, shown some level of resilience in terms of being able to speak about their story and, and I guess had a bit better understanding of what they'd be getting into if their life became public in this way. Um, so I think that was an important consideration in relation to thinking about the, the possible um, uh, working with an area where there's an enormous amount of trauma and you don't want to re-traumatise people. But I would say in this particular system, um, there are legal prohibitions on people being able to speak out on cases where there is a child protection order in place. So the use of animation in the film was not just a creative um, uh, a creative thing, but was also a creative solution to a legal problem about not being able to identify people who had active cases on. And I think in that sense, this goes to your observation about the resilience and the power that comes through. Um, one of the worst things about being caught up in the system is that you are shamed, you feel like you're on your own. And I think what a film like this can do for the um, Aboriginal audience is that it allows people to speak out in a system where they've been silenced and having a platform for their voice, I think is, I think it's overstating it to say it's a part of the healing, but I think it's a part of processing the anger and the frustration of what you're going through when you're in the system. So filmmaking really allows us to provide a space for people whose voices are being marginalized. I think that's one of the reasons why we're so drawn to it. Um, and I think, there was a, a, a sense of being able to celebrate the tenacity of, um, you know, of, of the, the women particularly um, who were so brave in speaking out. So that's why I think the resilience comes through that you, you see that these are people who've, who've never stopped fighting. Um, yeah. Fantastic. And I think part of your, you know, what strikes me about the off, screen life of your film beyond its production is, is very much this idea of the impact that the film should make in those communities but also outside not just the audience who, audiences who are seeing the film but bringing the film beyond those spaces um, and that impact marketing seems to be very much um, part and parcel um, of the film when you go into the film's website there's resources there's a pledge um, you can you know, have a, an in-depth look into the, the, the perspectives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders um, so I wanted you to kind of walk us through um, also that aspect of the film. Yeah, I guess, and it, again, you know, this, this is the benefit of doing a film that works on, that builds on a body of work. Because, you know, in the work that I do, you know, as an advocate trying to get the ch children back um, to their families, I do work with the Aboriginal community controlled organisation. So a lot of the relationships you'd want to have at the back end of a film to be able to really increase its impact. We were able to, I guess, go into the film with those already strongly established and, and understand what the community campaigns were around, around the sector. So for example, one of the things the sector had been working on was to have a national um, benchmark around the number of children being removed. It's been a really big campaign. Um, and it was just this year that the federal government's now included one of those um, KPIs or one of those benchmarks in its close the gap framework um, on, in, you know, on, on, on in its Indigenous portfolio. So it did allow us to, because we understood the, the landscape so much going in, to have the right partners who would then take it through and I guess as filmmakers we we understood that um, there would be community groups and the, the community our Aboriginal community controlled sector would be the ones who would really lead the advocacy around the film because we were building on their advocacy rather than mm -hmm. saying here's a film that's about changing the system 
here's a film that speaks to why these organisations are seeking to, to change the system. So a lot of people involved in the film, um, particularly all our, you know, our Indigenous um, experts we had in there along the way were people we had worked with. So that's why getting that, that, that together was such a big thing. But I just want to make one point that goes to your point about um, the, the importance of thinking about trauma. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a really triggering film for audiences, for Indigenous audiences. And I, I've always, whenever we've done a, a community screening, have said, you know, this is a film that will be very hard for people to watch. Um, we've had some screenings where we have had um, counsellors around in case people are triggered by what they see in their own, you know, in relation to their own experiences. Um, and, you know, um, when we played the film at Maryland, they did a wonderful thing where they had aunties available to give you a hug if you'd been traumatised by the film. So thinking about those, those impacts is important, but also in relation to the resources, what we find is people in the audience are actually in the position where they feel like they're fighting docs and didn't realise that other people were doing that too. So having the resources for people when they've seen the film and they they know that there are places to get help from now to do that. And look, I guess the other thing too, in terms of why thinking through those impacts and putting the website together the way we did was so important. We wanted a film where people would be angry. We wanted people to leave the cinema angry that this was happening. And we wanted to then, you know, um, find some agency for that anger by being able to say, here's, if you want to, if you are angry, here are some things you can do. Here are some campaigns you can get involved with. Here are some organisations you can support. Here are some actions you can do. So, you know, I think it's that thing about if we really want to get a reaction from an audience, how do we translate that into something that's really going to go to the heart of the issues in the film rather than just leave them angry and, and really not give people somewhere that they can use that anger for, for good. Yeah, I think it's really wonderful and above all praiseworthy that, that your film really has this idea of agency and activism built into it. Um, thank you for your insights. Um, Ella Maya, your film, I think, I rem if I remember correctly, there's a dedication at the end um, to Rosie and all those like Rosie. Um, can you describe to us what that dedication means exactly? Um, so the, the film is inspired by uh, an experience that I had Mm -hmm. um, in the same neighborhood where the film was shot. Um, and so there's a lot to unpack there. Um, like Larissa's film, we, we wanted to speak to the issue of, of Indigenous youth in care, particularly um, Indigenous youth who age out of care and are suddenly just sort of let mm -hmm. go from the system and have no support whatsoever. Um, and then we wanted to, to speak to this issue of violence against Indigenous women on a very um, lived and felt level. And so um, I was inspired to, to take this story, this experience that I had, which was very similar to that in the film, um, and turn it into, turn it into a film. Um, and so I, I worked with Kathleen Hepburn. She was my co-writer and co-director. Um, and we wanted indigenous women and youth to feel seen and heard um, and to feel as though they deserve space on screen because we so rarely see um, stories like this, which is um, urban indigenous women um, in these very intimate spaces, um, speaking about issues of, you know, the, the, the film sort of speaks to issues of, of class um, and light skin privilege and mm. all of those collisions of, of um, privilege or, or not, or lack, of pri or lack of privilege within the community. Um, and so I think when speaking to, to trauma and activism, the story was about um, not reenacting trauma, not re-traumatizing our audience because our audience was primarily, uh, we aimed primarily at indigenous women and youth. Um, and so we wanted to, um, to make a film wherein they felt seen and heard, but also not re-traumatized and having to sort of experience that pain again, because we so often see stories of, of victimhood on screen, um, wherein our audience, if they're Indigenous members, kind of walk away feeling um, re-victimized in, in some sort of way. Um, and so we, we went through a, a really interesting process. And I, I think the process of making the film as well um, 
was sort of a, a, a form of activism in the sense that we wanted to um, dismantle the sort of the hierarchical toxicity that exists within the film industry in particular. Um, and we wanted to make a film that was um, community oriented and um, very much about um, respect and, and reciprocity and um, um, a sense of equality on set. And so we brought a lot of Indigenous youth on for this Indigenous Youth Mentorship Project. Um, we, uh, they worked in sort of a creative and collaborative way with the head of each department. Um, we did a script workshop with young Indigenous women who had been through the foster care system because we wanted to make sure that you know, as two women who hadn't been through foster care, that we were representing them in a way where they again felt seen and heard. Um, and then we we took uh, we, we took we put a lot of thought into um, how to take care of our lead actress Violet Nelson, who'd had um, lived experiences very similar to that of Rosie on screen. Um, and so we. We went through a four-week rehearsal process with her, and much of that process was was um, making sure that she felt safe in the space, um, and making sure that we were uh, always considering how to best take care of her because it, it, you know it's such a heavy film. Um, and so, <laughs> Kathleen and I actually went and saw uh, a counselor to learn about trauma-informed care and mm -hmm. how to. Um, you know, bring in sort of tactics or tools into our work and uh, I work with Violet um, to take care of her through our rehearsal process. Um, and then we had uh, an elder from her community there for her throughout the rehearsal process and then also throughout production. And so, um, yeah, I, like I was saying, I think the process of making the film was also about, um, very much about considering trauma and um, how we can change the way the film industry works. Um, and then also, uh, yeah, thinking about who our audience was uh, first and foremost as well. Fantastic. And I wanted to go back um, to kind of pedal back slightly to the question of the portrayal or non-portrayal of violence on screen and also how that links to the question of creating spaces of healing. And so the Black feminist theorist Tina Kampt um, in relation to black visuality employs the term the practice of refusal um, to describe a refusal to reenact or to perpetuate images of violence on screen, something that you've both talked about. Um, to what extent does this um, apply to, to both of your films? I mean, Larissa, you've spoken um, about the use of animation, which in a way responds to that request. Um, and also, how do you um, both imagine your filmic spaces as a place of healing? Um, perhaps if we could start with Larissa. Um, yeah, and look, I, I guess the, for me, the most graphic thing that we have in the film is at the beginning where we've got the audio of an actual child removal, mm. uh, which, is, which is really traumatising, but it is exactly the way it feels when it happens. And it was that thing about, uh, I couldn't think of another way to, to explain to people who've never been through it what it must be like and, and what it's like for a child. Because I think the, as, as harrowing it is, as it is to hear the mother and grandmother, it's the child in that process that is, you know, really the, heart, the, the most heartbreaking. Um, so, you know, I, I, I guess we, you know, you only, you only hear the sound. And I think it was one of, you know, we thought, obviously thought about what kind of images we would put under that and in the end we didn't put any um, uh, in the sense it was completely off screen but you heard the audio I think um, was a way of, of, of being able to do that and obviously that was an audio that was taken at the time of a removal we didn't reenact anything this was something that we had um, and um, negotiated with the family um, concerned who appears in the film about using it as part of their story, but they very much wanted it to be heard because this happened to them and they wanted to hear how people had, had treated them. Uh, but it is very triggering to people, as I said, that, that you know, there's a complexity around what we do to the audience when we play it. Um, so yeah, for me, I think it was really important to have that off screen. And uh, my film before that was about the murder of three Aboriginal children and similarly, 
we do not reenact. And, and I work very closely with the families and they were quite adamant. The one thing they wouldn't talk about were the actual murders. And so we, you know, we didn't um, in terms of going through the graphic details of it. Um, in a way, I don't think you need it. It's so gratuitous. What you see is the, is the pain and the impact. And I think you can trust an audience to be sympathetic, empathetic, um, intelligent enough to, to, to understand the depth of what they're seeing without having to gratuitously and graphically show it. And I think there's a power in the way, particularly as Indigenous filmmakers, we think about silence as opposed to noise. And um, I think, you know, that's obviously another another thing, particularly in Aboriginal Australian cultures, we have a saying that silence is more important than words. The time for contemplation and thinking, giving an audience moments to think through and process what they're seeing can be as powerful as trying to shock them into something. Amazing. Um, to shift gears slightly from the trauma to the healing, in The Body Remembers When the World Broke Up and we see um, a form of solidarity form between the, 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 the character played by yourself, Elamaya, and Rosie. Um, do you conceive that in itself as a space of healing? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about refusal, which is that, you know, we've mm. seen so much violence against women on screen. And because our, our, our audience uh, you know, we meant to we meant to make this film for Indigenous women and youth. We we knew that they didn't need to see it again. That's uh, that's not what the story is about. The story is about what happens after the violence, and it's about um, the strength and the beauty and the love and the kinship that exists between these two women um, who share this common history and share this common lived reality of of colonialism here in Canada, um, but come from very very different lived experiences and have been impacted in very different ways by, by that history and, that, and that, the present reality that we all live in. Um, and so it, it, the film was again about, about love and kinship and about the complexities of unpacking that sort of um, live violence um, and the ways that we navigate through the systems that, that are in place to either support or um, inhibit us from uh, from healing and moving forward as a community. And so, yes, it was absolutely about that. Um, and uh, we wanted to make a film um, wherein we, we see the uh, the nurturing and the love that, that exists between Indigenous women, and especially in urban, urban settings. We don't necessarily see that very often. And in urban settings, we have people from everywhere and um, a beautiful sense of community um, wherein you know we have so many different people representing so many different indigenous communities and it can almost feel diasporic in a way um, and uh, we wanted to show that you know that um, our communities have all experienced this in very different ways but we share that history we share that reality and how do we unpack that together and um, how do these relationships between Indigenous women especially um, strengthen and uphold our communities, be it urban or, or within our, our, our First Nations or reserved communities. Thank you. And I think exactly that's what um, in many ways really underpins the humanity of the film, um, this idea of, of nurturing and community building, um, which you see on a, on, a, on a micro level, let's say, between um, the character that you play and Rosie. Um, I wanted to um, make a reference to our good friend Pauline Craig, who is a, a programmer who's been watching Indigenous films for at least one or two decades. Um, and she, in her essay, um, The Five Beats of Indigenous Storytelling, um, without essentializing, she describes um, what she calls as, what she names um, two opposing gazes and worldviews based on um, the programming of these Indigenous films for quite a while and so she talks about the white gaze which is embedded in materiality and individualism and capitalism and the indigenous gaze or worldview which is embedded in connection um, and kinship as you've both uh, mentioned and from which um, you know in terms of the characters which are portrayed strength and resilience is derived 
Um, I wanted to um, explore with you, both of you, the extent to which um, both of these um, perspectives collide in your films, um, the extent to which your films perhaps um, decolonize the gaze. I think it's true of both of your films. Um, I think it's true to say of both of your films that they, in, in many ways they um, center and decenter the gaze, depending on which gaze we're talking about. Um, perhaps you could begin with Larissa. Sure. Um, and look, I, I guess the film is about a system that's been an aggressive part of colonisation in different forms. The removal of Aboriginal children has been a, a tactic in, in um, for, um, a range of um, colonised colonized societies as a way of um, trying to undermine First Nations culture. So we share this experience particularly with um, Canadian brothers and sisters, but at New Zealand brothers and sisters, Maori brothers and sisters. So it, it is actually part of the colonisation process. So when we see the rates of Aboriginal child removal increasing today, that is a continuation of a colonising process. So the film at its heart is challenging a colonial structure. It is really almost at the coalface of families fighting against a continual aggressive colonisation. Um, so it's really important in that context to be providing the, to I guess be naming that and then providing the, you know, the alternative gaze. And, and I think embedded in, in Pauline's observations about that is this idea that there's almost a dual process that we go through as we decolonise we are also asserting our sovereignty, that that's where the resilience and power comes from, um, that we're, we are asserting our, our cultural identities, our power as Indigenous people, um, our sovereignty as Indigenous people, and, and asserting our agency. Um, and that's, you know, that's, I, th I think those two things work together in intention. In um, so, I, you know, I, I think that, also, the, the, the other aspect of that that comes through um, in, in the Indigenous storytelling that I think Pauline's work picks up really importantly um, is also connection to, to each other, which I think comes through particularly in After the Apology because of its focus on families. But it is about connection to culture and connection to country. And I think it, um, in Indigenous filmmaking and in the Indigenous gaze, that idea of uh, place and identity has a particular importance, the reassertion of that, the assertion of sovereignty, because it's been such a big part of what's also been taken away from us as part of the colonisation process. And that process also sees other people telling our stories and writing our stories out. So, you know, the act of storytelling is an act of, of resilience and survival and celebration. And, you know, I think we feel we feel all of those things when we put together a film that tells a story that we're engaging in a myriad of, of, of activisms mm. uh, because of where we sit in relation to a colonial state and what the issues that we're looking at um, say in, in relation to those, um, to those colonial relationships. We challenge, we're, in our daily lives as Indigenous people, we challenge those every day just as we're challenged by them. And at the end of it, I think we would all say that our resilience is a testament to how tenaciously we've fought against them. So um, Pauline's comments always raise lots of issues to me. I'm not sure that was really coherent, but um, she does, you know, I think help us think really, really deeply about how we articulate what's, what's now developing, particularly in Australia, within an increasing body of work by Indigenous filmmakers to be able to now to start to pull apart some of these threads and think about Indigenous film and Indigenous filmmaking um, in, a, in a deeper, more intellectual way. Thank you. And you mentioned um, quite prominently the, the idea of challenging the gaze, and this is a question which I wanted to carry over to you, Elamaya. Do you feel that your film in some way challenges the gaze um, with regards to the violence perpetrated against Indigenous women? Was there in some way embedded within your film a critique or a not a critique, but a support of the uh, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls into spirit movement in Canada. Um, yes, absolutely. I think uh, to kind of uh, echo what Larissa was saying, um, 
narrative sovereignty is is, is so important uh, in terms of indigenous representation on screen. Um, it's it's critical that we are the ones uh, leading leading this movement to tell our stories on screen. Um, and storytelling is an act of, of resilience and, and celebration and um, and beauty. And I think um, in terms of thinking about the gaze, uh, it should always, you know, come to thinking about the audience and the way that a story is told. Um, and because this was for Indigenous women, there's so much that doesn't need to be said on screen um, because it is about that lived experience, knowing that our audience has had those lived experiences, maybe not exactly the same. Um, and, you know, you see on screen these two women who have had very different lived experiences um, uh, and the ways that that, that history is, is lived in their bodies. Um, and so when we think about, um, especially representations of indigenous women uh, on screen, there's often this, this, these stories of victimhood. And I think we see it in the black community as well as white, white settler audiences, especially here in North America, are um, very comfortable with seeing people of color victimized on screen. They're very comfortable with, um, with, with seeing these, especially historical uh, representations of, of people who have been victimized. Um, and so this was also about um, challenging that, about, um, about showing how we within our own communities have the capacity and the power to, to move forward, how, how we heal as a community without any sort of um, white settler intervention um, or, or need for, for, for a white savior um, to sort of lift us up because we have, we have everything we need within our communities. And, um, and so it was about all of those things. I think we have everything we need in our communities. It's a beautiful point um, to round off this discussion. Thank you, first of all, for helping us to um, think differently and to challenge the ways in which we um, portray violence, portray um, trauma, um, the ways in which we think about vict victimhood and healing, and um, most of all, the power of um, solidarity and unity. Um, thank you so much for your deep insights today. Um, if you want to learn more about um, both Larissa and Elamaya and both of their films, and you can go to the websites um, www.afterthepology.com and www.ella-maya-tailfeathers.com. So thank you to Larissa and Ella Maya. Thank you very much for your time. Um, and thank you for joining, and please stay tuned for more Conversations at the College 2020. Take care. And I have a message from Regina. That's